self-proclaiming people. Amen. This morning, we're beginning a new series on the Holy Spirit called Living Water. And some happen to recognize that this is supposed to be water uh, behind us. Uh, If you weren't sure, pretend it's water. That's what it hopefully looks like. But on this Pentecost Sunday, it's a great opportunity to focus our hearts for the next few weeks on the Holy Spirit. And of course, on Pentecost Sunday, we think of Acts chapter 2. Verses 1 through 4, when it says, When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, we are going to come back to this passage later on in this series to look a little bit more in depth in terms of what is actually taking place here and why it's taking place. But before we even do that, I feel like there's another question that we need to step back and ask, and that is, okay, the Holy Spirit falls upon the believers. So one question that we might want to start with is, who is the Holy Spirit? And that's a question we want to focus on this morning. Who is this Holy Spirit? Because it's a question that we sometimes take for granted. It's a question that sometimes we don't take seriously enough because we understand that in our theology that we recognize the three members of the Trinity as co-equal, co-eternal, and uh, their Father, Son, Holy Spirit. But when it comes down to the nuts and bolts of how we live and how we talk and how we live out our Christian lives, it's more like we've got the Father and the Son and then the Holy Spirit's kind of down here and we don't really know what to do with Him. Because we, we get the Father, we understand who the Father is, and, and there's kind of a dignity and a reverence that we associate with the Father, and, and we understand who Jesus is, and there's a, almost a gentlemanly nature of Jesus, and we can wrap our minds around that, but when it comes to the Holy Spirit, we're not quite sure what to do, because even though we have this uh, dignified sense of the Father and this gentlemanly understanding of Jesus, we come to the Holy Spirit and we kind of feel like he's that crazy uncle at a family gathering. Just, if you don't acknowledge him, then he won't cause any trouble. And I know I spent many years in a church that we could talk all day long about God the Father and God the Son, Jesus Christ. But when it came to the Holy Spirit, it was like walking on eggshells. Like if we talk about him too much, he might actually show up and we're not sure we want that to happen. Who is the Holy Spirit? It's interesting that in both the Hebrew and the Greek, there's the same type of definition for spirit being used in reference to the Holy Spirit. In Hebrew, it's ruach, or if, if I'm to get my, impress my old Hebrew professors, it'd be ruach. I just spit on the microphone. That's embarrassing. The word means spirit, wind, and breath. In the Greek, it's pneuma. It's spirit, wind, and breath. There's a couple interesting observations about that. Both of those definitions refer to something that's invisible, that's not seen. You can't see wind, you can't see a spirit, you can't see breath. However, with all of those, there is a side effect. There's a result that the wind or the breath can act upon, and you can see that. If I were to, as I do at the end of every service, walk around and blow my wind at the candles, the flame goes out. Now, none of you can see me blowing on the candles, but you can see the result of the candle. It's breath. It's invisible, but it has an impact. And maybe the person you're sitting closest to, their breath is having an impact on you, and uh, you'd advise them to have a mint or Uh, Make sure that the mask is properly affixed to the the face. It's morning. We haven't eaten in a while. I get it. Not even a little chuckle. Anyway. So I love that Ruach and Numa 
are what we have for the Holy Spirit in terms of descriptions, because we cannot see the Holy Spirit. But what we're going to see throughout this series is that we best see the Holy Spirit in the Spirit's impact upon a life, upon a group of people. But there's two key things I want us to see about the Holy Spirit to answer the question, who is the Holy Spirit? Now, back in 2017, on Sunday nights, we went through a series on the Holy Spirit, and we just went Genesis through Revelation, and, and we looked at every verse that talked about the Holy Spirit. And we're not going to do that in this series. We're going to kind of thematically look at some of these. But there's two main points that come up in all of the verses speaking about the Holy Spirit. There's two key themes in terms of the Holy Spirit's identity. And the first key part of the Holy Spirit's identity that we want to look at is the Holy Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit is a member of the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, co-equal, co-eternal, just the same that there's no Father, Son, Holy Spirit. They were all three on an equal footing. So with that, we have a lot of subcategories in terms of the Holy Spirit being God. The first of which, we know that the Holy Spirit is eternal. Just like God the Father, just like God the Son, Jesus Christ, God the Holy Spirit is an eternal being. Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, it says, The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And the word for hover there just means resting. So at the very beginning of all creation, God the Father is just there because he's always existed. God the Son is there because he's eternally existed. And God the Holy Spirit is just there because he's always existed. And the word for hover there means resting. So the Holy Spirit's just kind of hanging out, waiting to do his thing. But same as the Father and Son, even before the creation of the world, the Holy Spirit just was. God has no beginning. God will have no end. That applies to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14, it says, How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? God is eternal. That applies to God the Father, God the Son, as well as God the Holy Spirit. The second thing about the Holy Spirit and the fact that he is God is that he is creator. We don't often think of the Holy Spirit as creator. We typically think of God the Father. But as we look at the New Testament, suddenly we find out that in Colossians, creation of the world is attributed to the Son, Jesus Christ. But we also see the creative aspect of the Holy Spirit. Psalm 104, verse 30. Speaking of things living, uh, small things and great things, it says, When you send forth your spirit, they are created, and you renew the face of the ground. The Holy Spirit was part of the work of cre the creation of the universe. Just as much as we see that action attributed to the Father, we see that action attributed to God the Son, we also see creation of the universe attributed to God the Holy Spirit. Matthew chapter 1, verse 18, it says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is the one who created Jesus in flesh in the womb of Mary. The Holy Spirit is creator. In John chapter 6, verse 63, it says, It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. And here speaking of spiritual life. Not only is the Holy Spirit creator of physical life, but the Holy Spirit is the creator of spiritual life. He's eternal. He's a creator. He's also omnipresent. A big fancy word meaning he's everywhere present. There's no place you can go where the Holy Spirit is not present. Psalm 139 verse 7. The psalmist says, where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? And he goes on to list all these different places he wants to go so that he could try to hide from the Spirit of God. And the conclusion of the psalm is, there's no place. No matter where I go, no matter where I hide, he says, there your Spirit is. The Holy Spirit is everywhere present. Holy Spirit's also omniscient, a fancy word for all-knowing. The Holy Spirit knows all things. 
1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 10 through 11. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except the Spirit of that person, which is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. If we had, we're nowhere close to fully understanding the mind and intentions of God. For all of our obsession with having everything figured out and neatly packaged, we're nowhere near it. But the Holy Spirit knows the mind of God because the Holy Spirit is God. So how does the Trinity work? We'll, we'll get there. But the Spirit knows everything the Father knows. The Spirit knows everything the Son knows. The Spirit knows everything. And the Spirit knows what's in our hearts. So the Holy Spirit is God. He's eternal. He's a creator. He's omnipresent. He's omniscient, but he's also immeasurable. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 13. Who has measured the spirit of the Lord? Or what man shows him his counsel? Basically, we cannot fully wrap our minds around the Holy Spirit. Just as we can't fully wrap our minds around God the Father. We can't fully wrap our minds around God the Son. We can't say, okay, here's this neat, tidy little box, and God the Father fits in this little box, and Jesus fits in this little box, and the Holy Spirit fits in this little box. We are not that bright. We are not that massive to be able to comprehend or measure or figure out who the Holy Spirit is. Next, he's co-equal with the Father and co-equal with the Son. Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, is part of the Great Commission. It says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. You've probably read that verse hundreds of times and skipped over one significant word because when we talk about the Great Commission, we don't usually focus on this particular word. The one circled in red. What's, what would you say about that word, name? Singular or plural? Singular. How many individuals are mentioned? Three. One name. One name, three individuals. They all share the same essence. They all share the same name. It's not the names of the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit. It's the name. The one name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is co-equal with the Father and the Son. John chapter 14, verses 16 to 17. I love this verse, verse and a half, where it says, and Jesus says, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth. Which is another way of saying, which is the Spirit of truth. And the word that he uses for another there is alas, which means another of the same kind. And this is so important. And I know I, I've probably referenced this analogy so many times you might get sick of it. But if I had a can of Dr. Pepper, which if you're going to have a pop, you should have a Dr. Pepper. Have a Dr. Pepper and I finish it. And I ask for another. And you come walking in with a Pepsi. Did you bring me another pop? Yes, but another of a different kind. There's a Greek word that could have been used here to say another of a different kind. So it's a pop. It's, it's not the same as the first one, but it's still a pop. Jesus deliberately uses another of the same kind. I finish a Dr. Pepper, you bring another Dr. Pepper. It's another of the same exact kind. So that you can't distinguish the first one from the second one. Jesus tells his disciples in telling that, that he's going to leave them. He says, don't worry because I'm going to ask the father. He's going to send you in my place another of the same type as me. So that there's going to be no distinguishing between the first and the second. So that there's no distinguishing between me and the Holy Spirit. It's just, I was here physically for you to look at. The Holy Spirit's going to be invisible. Other than that, same exact thing. 
The Holy Spirit is another of the same kind as Jesus. So this idea of Jesus as the the gentleman, nice, uh, just respectful, and the Holy Spirit as the wild frat boy, those images don't work because Jesus said the Holy Spirit is another of the same exact kind as he himself. Except Jesus goes one step farther to say it's actually going to be better for you to have the Holy Spirit. Because... When Jesus is present, you can walk arm in arm with Jesus. Sorry. You can walk arm in arm with Jesus and have a wonderful time. But when the Holy Spirit comes, Jesus is now in you, living inside of you. And Jesus says, that's going to be even better. So the only difference, the Holy Spirit's another of the same kind, except he's going to live in you instead of alongside of you. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11. It says, You were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Now, think about those terms. You were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified. These are actions that we easily associate with the Father. We obviously associate with Jesus Christ. But here the verse is saying, oh, it's... Also by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit washes you. The Holy Spirit sanctifies you. The Holy Spirit justifies you. So all of these actions that are done by the Father, we know they're done by the Son, are also done by the Holy Spirit. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is God. He's eternal. He's creator. He's omnipresent. He's omniscient. He's immeasurable. He's co-equal. He is God. The second thing I want us to see, not only is the Holy Spirit God, the Holy Spirit is a person. The Holy Spirit is a person. So often we refer to the Holy Spirit as it. We have this almost mentality deeply embedded that the Holy Spirit is kind of like this power source or energy that acts upon us and we we don't properly first and foremost identify the holy spirit as a person just like the father just like the son where do we see that well first of all we see what can be done to the holy spirit first of all the holy spirit can be grieved isaiah chapter 63 verse 10 but they rebelled and grieved his holy spirit literally they hurt or pained the Holy Spirit. The Israelites in their rebellion against God in the wilderness, they hurt, they grieved, they pained the Holy Spirit. Now, this guitar pick, I've broken a lot of guitar picks because I get, I like the really flimsy one. Now, if I were to take this pick and break it, this guitar pick would feel no pain it would have no response. It wouldn't be like, hey, you big jerk, why'd you do that? This guitar pick has no feelings whatsoever. You can do whatever you want to this guitar pick, it's not going to care because it's not a living being. It's a thing. This pulpit is not a living being. The pew you're sitting on is not a living being. No feelings, no emotions, no reactions. What do we see here about the Holy Spirit when the people of God in the Old Testament disobeyed? It caused pain to the Holy Spirit. It grieved the Holy Spirit. You can only hurt or grieve something or someone who is a living being. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 30 carries the same thought. It says, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Don't cause grief or sorrow to the Holy Spirit in the way that you live your life. The way that we live our lives can cause hurt or pain to the Holy Spirit who's living within us. If the Holy Spirit is just some power source, like you've plugged in an amp to an electrical outlet, you can't hurt or offend the electrical outlet or the electricity coming through it. You can only hurt or cause sorrow to a person. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 29, where it says, and has outraged the spirit of grace. We can outrage or insult the Holy Spirit. Again, things that we cannot do to a non-living being. 
The Holy Spirit is a person because he can be grieved. The Holy Spirit is a person because he can be tested. Acts chapter 5, verse 3. Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? I can't lie to my phone. I can only lie to a person who's talking to me through the phone, but I can't look at this phone and say, wow, you're really pretty. It's not, it's just a phone. It, it, it doesn't care. I can't lie to an object. I can't lie to some force. I can only lie to a person which I don't, I don't intentionally do. Just want to make that clear. Acts chapter 5, verse 9, it says, How is it that you have agreed together to test the Spirit of the Lord? And the word for test there means to maliciously test one's feelings or judgments. And this is the story of Ananias and Sapphira who sold some property so they can give it to the church. And they kept some for themselves, which they were allowed to do, but they told the apostles and everyone, oh, we're giving everything. And they're called out on it. It says, why are you lying to the Holy Spirit? But it's interesting as you look at that passage, even in Acts chapter 5, there's this interchange as Peter talks to Ananias and Sapphira where one minute he says, why are you lying to God? And a couple verses later, why are you lying to the Holy Spirit? Peter is interchanging God and the Holy Spirit in his conversation. The Holy Spirit can be tested. There's birds chirping behind me. I don't know why. It's all right. They're having a praise time. It's good. The Holy Spirit can be grieved. The Holy Spirit can be tested, lied to, put to the test. Because the Holy Spirit is a person. He's not just an entity. The Holy Spirit is God. And the Holy Spirit is a person who is living within believers. And we're going to get more into that next week and who has the Holy Spirit. But the point I want us to take away this morning is since the Holy Spirit is God and a person, you can relate to him just as you do the Father and the Son. Do you? Do you have a relationship with God, the Holy Spirit? Now, we can often unblinkingly say, yes, I have a relationship with God the Father. Yes, I have a relationship with God the Son. Can you also say, yes, I have a relationship with God the Holy Spirit? He's a person. And people exist for relationship. The Holy Spirit desires to have a relationship with you. Do you have a relationship with the Holy Spirit? What is it like? Is the Holy Spirit just someone who's a part of your life, but he's kind of back here somewhere, and you're not really sure what he's up to, but he's doing something? Do you have an ongoing, engaging relationship with the Holy Spirit? To where you recognize his voice when he speaks to you, to understand when he's prompting you to do something? What's your relationship like with God, the Holy Spirit? Because if we have this dynamic relationship with God the Father, God the Son, Jesus Christ, but not God the Holy Spirit, then we have a deficient relationship with God because the Holy Spirit is God. And my prayer for us in kind of the, the silliness of the, the background here is that the living water of the Holy Spirit would just wash over every one of us by the time this series comes to an end. But I want us to start at this point of understanding who the Holy Spirit is as God, as a person with whom we should have a relationship. And so again, my question for us is, what is your relationship like with the Holy Spirit this morning? Let's pray.